Hello, everyone. My name is Luan, and I will be presenting today's webinar to you. I am in Cape Town, South Africa, and it would be great to see where you are today. I already see some names and locations coming through. So yes, please, for the rest of you who have not said hi yet, please do so in the to see where you are today. So in the meantime, I'll give you a very brief introduction to myself. I'm a language practitioner, Cambridge examiner and tutor trainer from Cape Town, South Africa. But the best of all is that I've been a teacher, an English teacher for over 13 years. And during that time, I have taught students of all ages, all levels from all over. It's been a wonderful journey and I'm very excited to be part of your journey. So let's have a look at who we've got with us today and the names have just been pouring in. That's fantastic. We have some South Africa. Hello, Pierre. We have, I think it's CG, CG from Pretoria in South Africa. Hello to you. Zarin from Johannesburg, South Africa too. Hello. And then we have London, uh, Fran, Fran from London, hi and welcome today. Emma, Emma from the USA, hello to you. We have Deborah from Barbados, we have a visitor from France, hello. We have Natalia, Natalia, hello, from Sicily in Italy and from California. And M, M from South Africa, hello to you. We have Shailen, Shailen's from Johannesburg, South Africa. And we have visitors from the UK. We have visitors from KZN, hello, KZN in South Africa, to be specific. Um, and then we also have visitors from uh, Austria, hello. Wow, lots and lots of names pouring in from Canada. We have more visitors from Britain. Victoria, Romania, welcome to all of you. It's wonderful to have you here today. So we are going to be doing quite a lot today and it's an interesting one because we'll be looking at different kinds of lesson plans, different kinds of lesson plans for different skill sets, how to structure these lesson plans and get the best out of your students during these lessons. So do note that today's webinar will specifically be covering just this topic. And additional questions outside of today's topic, do not stress, but send them along to tutor support where we will be more than happy to answer them. But today's questions relating to the topic are what will be answered. And also, as mentioned, we will be having a Q&A later on. But I do suggest that you hang on to your questions and then type them during Q&A so that I do not miss any of them if you do type them a little bit earlier on. So let's get straight into it. We've got quite lots and lots of information. Let's get going. Right, so as mentioned, we're going to be looking at different kinds of lesson plans. And the very first thing that we're going to be looking at today is lesson planning and what it involves. So of course, when we think about a lesson, we need to think about what we want to achieve. We need to write the lesson plan. We need to create or source materials for the lesson activities. And lessons usually follow a structure that makes it easier for teachers to plan. And in most cases, lessons have a warmer, a body of the lesson, which can take various forms and a plenary right at the end. And this structure provides a stable scaffold for the lesson. And lots of people tend to think, why? Why plan? Why stick to these plans? Well, especially for new teachers, it gives you that security that you know what's coming next. As a new teacher, I always used to have my plan on the desk and I would basically just walk over to my desk glance at what was coming next just to anchor myself and just to remind myself of what was coming so that my lesson had that fluidity and I do recommend that you do that too. Right, so when we think about an actual lesson, the warmer is that very first stage and the warmer introduces the topic of the lesson where the body is the main teaching and learning part. The body is where you and your students are busiest and then the plenary, it should 
it offers some part, some kind of consolidation um, and or ref a reflection on the learning content of the body of the lesson. And within the body of the lesson, we can have different lesson structures. It provides a frame or a skeleton on which to hang all the different elements of a lesson. And the plenary is used to review what has been learnt, perhaps through a whole class discussion or a Q&A or a few eliciting questions right at the end just to consolidate the lesson and to consolidate learning. So the WBP, the Warmer Body Plenary, can describe the structure of any lesson really and it may in, in incorporate PPP, which is Present, Practice, Produce, or TTT, which is teach, sorry, test, teach, test. I'll repeat that just for clarity. PPP, present, practice, produce, or TTT, which is test, teach, test. These structures could form part of the body. Let's move on. Right, so within the body, of course, we've got these two structures we spoke about briefly. The body of the lesson, as we mentioned, can include PPP or TTT. So let's look at the PPP structure first, right? So PPP stands for present, practice, and produce. And this is one of the most common lesson structures that you'll come across. And again, lots of people tend to say, well, it's very prescriptive. But remember, you can add your own flavor and you can add your own um, your own themes, your own activities, keeping to the structure, but adding creativity through the activities and themes and contexts that you choose. So as mentioned, it is one of the most common lesson structures uh, that you'll come across. The very first stage of the PPP plan is present. The presentation stage gives your students the information they need to manipulate the language. This structure can be used for grammar, it can be used for a reading lesson, it can be used for listening or even a pronunciation lesson. And then the very next stage is practice. And during the practice stage of the lesson, we provide the students with controlled practice activities to support language learning. And the focus here is accuracy. So think about your worksheets, your gap fills, your matching tasks, your unscrambling tasks, your error correction activities. Here, the focus is accuracy. The answers of these worksheets are predetermined. So the answers that your students produce here are either right or wrong. And that's why we call this controlled practice. This is when they knuckle down quietly and focus on the form of what you've taught them. And then we have the third stage, which is produce. And during this stage, give your students activities where they are encouraged to produce the language and develop fluency in communicative activities. And I really want you to hold on to the word fluency here. Your students should be given some freedom with the time target language. They should be allowed to communicate. Think about how they will use the target language outside and then design activities that would give them the opportunity to practice in this way. So there we've had PPP, present, practice and produce. And the next one we're going to look at is TTT. So the acronym TTT stands for T test. I keep getting that wrong. Test, teach, test. TTT is a good lesson structure to choose when you plan to introduce a complex topic or contrast a new concept to one that your students already know. So use the TTT structure to find a learner's knowledge gaps while supporting them through the lesson to fill the gap or gaps at the same time. And there are five stages to a TTT lesson if we also include warmer, and plenary stages. This also applies to PPP, always a warm at the beginning, always a plenary stage right at the end, which then you'll see gives you a total of five stages. Right, so when we think about a lesson plan, it's good to think about what commonly forms part of a lesson plan. So think about the lesson details. Think about the class you're teaching. The level, for example, are they an intermediate class? Are they a pre-intermediate class? Are they an advanced class? 
Think about the date because it's always good to record that so that you can go back to old lessons and see, okay, I've already done the, that with this class. I won't be repeating that. It's just a good way for you to keep track of your work. And then also the topic of the lesson. Example, adverbs of frequency. The length of the lesson is important, not only for execution, but for planning. Example, 60 minutes for a lesson. The number of students, again, important for materials and how many of these you'll need. And then, of course, the lesson type, whether it's a, a grammar lesson, a skills lesson, exactly what will be the focus or the target language in that particular lesson. Right, so we're still on lesson plans and we're still on the common features of a lesson plan. So the other things that you need to think of is the lesson aim. So your aim focuses on the teaching or the learning part of the lesson. So ask yourself, what is the new information or skill the students are learning here? What do you want them to achieve by the end of the lesson? So for example, an aim could be by the end of the lesson, students will be able to use frequency adverbs to describe routines. And that would be an example of an aim, that universal goal of that lesson. And then we get to something a little bit more specific as I move on to the next slide, and that would be the lesson objectives. These are, think about them as the little steps the students will take in class to achieve these aims. And when we look critically at each objective, we should ask ourselves, is it realistic? Is it achievable? Is it measurable? Um, for example, students will use four common frequency adverbs to describe their morning routine. That would be an example of an objective. The actual little activities that will be done in order to achieve the aims that you've set out at the start of the lesson. So almost make a note here and write down that your lesson objectives are those little steps, those little activities they will do to achieve the greater goal, the aim, the lesson aim. Right, more things to consider when it comes to lesson planning are your materials and your equipment. Your example, your technology. Will you be using an interactive whiteboard? Will you have worksheets, flashcards, imagery that you will project for your students? That would be the equipment that you'll be using. Also, anticipated problems. So universally, you can think about what could go wrong. For example, if technology fails, what backup plan do you have? Will students complete the lesson before the time is up? What added tasks can you prepare for students who finish quickly? And also issues students may have when trying to understand the new form and function. Will they have a problem with contractions in the target language? Are there pronunciation issues that you can anticipate? Are there first language interference problems that you can anticipate here? So remember, your anticipated problems, the general anticipation, problems involved with the actual structure of the lesson technology and so on but then also yes think about those problems that may come up with the actual target language and the acquisition thereof and then also think about a few solutions I always say think about a solution before you give me a problem so think about solutions have a backup plan um, for all your anticipated problems for example if technology fails do you have paper-based worksheets and visuals Time management, do you have extra tasks if students finish early, for example? And these are all little things that are, well, I say little things, but big things that you need to consider when planning a lesson. Early days, I would finish early. My students would finish early. They'd leave early and I'd get wrapped over the knuckles for finishing my lessons early. So always have a few activities in hand or in your pocket that you can pull out if your students are quick finishers. Right, so when we think about lessons, the important things, if, if you remember earlier, we touched on the various stages of these lessons, right? So if we think about, let's look at a reading lesson first. So the very first stage of a reading lesson is, yes, you've guessed it, a warm-up. 
And here we elicit the possible topic of the text from our students. We can use visuals. These are my favorite because you don't reveal anything related to the target language. You don't tell them what the reading is about, but visuals very often give them an opportunity to actually predict what they think the reading is going to be about. And then, of course, there's the next stage, and this is the pre-teach vocabulary stage. So think about it the night before, a few days before, you have gone through the reading and you've selected vocabulary items that would be necessary for the understanding of the text. And language level is important here, so use a vocabulary profiler. And just a tip, a very important tip, if your students are, for example, B1 students, they most likely know most of the B1 level words in the reading text. So focus on words above that level because these are the words they will not know. Hence the need for pre-teaching. So don't forget the vocabulary profiler. Right, and the very next stage we're going to look at is the first reading task. So the first reading task is for skimming and or scanning. But I will tell you another tip is that skimming questions are far more valuable here. And do not include more than two to three uh, questions in total. Because remember, this is meant to be a quick read. They're supposed to just quickly look at the text and see if they can actually answer the questions, which is in itself a very valuable reading skill. And in the very next uh, stage is your second reading task. And now we're testing comprehension for deeper understanding. So at least seven, preferably open-ended questions here to really check that they understand what it is they're reading in that text. And then finally, one of my favorite stages, the follow on communicative class, uh, task. Yes, I know it's a reading lesson, but this gives them the opportunity to verbally respond to the text with their thoughts, their views, their opinions. So a good example here is a small group discussion based on themes from the reading text. A whole class discussion often means that students do not all get a chance to participate. So I like putting my students into pairs or groups where they get to discuss. But remember, we cannot just tell students talk about the topic. You need to facilitate this, you need to set this up. Give them discussion questions, give them role play tasks. You do need to set this up and th that gives them enough support with which to uh, finish the task. Right, so that was a reading lesson. So now we're going to look briefly at the stages of a listening lesson. And you'll be very relieved to know that it is very, very similar to that of a reading lesson lesson. Yes, we also have a warmer. And again, we like to get them to predict what they think the listening is going to be about. A great way once again to do this is with a few visual prompts. Um, and also the very next stage is your pre-teach vocabulary stage. Back when I was a new teacher, I always thought, why pre-teach the vocabulary? Isn't that giving information away that they really should work up for themselves? But think about it. What is the main aim of the lesson, of a listening lesson? to practice the skill of listening. So pre-teach the difficult vocabulary, get it out of the way so that your students really can knuckle down and enjoy the skill listening um, that they're meant to be practicing. Right, so listening continued. The very next stage that we're going to look at here is the first listening task. So the first listening task is a light listen. This is just to establish that they've understood the gist of what they've heard. And here we tend to practice extensive listening. And then we move on to a more in-depth listening, the second listening. And again, here we give them a more um, a meatier bit of uh, comprehension question. So remember the first listening, two to three questions. The second listening, again, seven to 10 comprehension questions. And then finally, once again, that lovely follow on communicative task where they get to discuss, they get to relate the listening to their own lives, their own thoughts, their own views, and their own personal experiences. Right, so there we briefly looked at at a reading lesson, 
and also a listening lesson. And now we're going to be looking at a grammar lesson and the stages involved in a grammar lesson. Now, remember, we spoke about PPP earlier and how it can be uh, how it can be incorporated into the body of a grammar lesson. And that's exactly what we're going to do right now. So once again, yes, you've guessed it. The very first stage of a grammar lesson is the warmer. Now, the warmer is to establish a context. A context needs to be relatable and it needs to really set the scene for your lesson. So if you're teaching them, for example, a future tense, show them a picture of something coming up in the future, like the holidays. If you're teaching them a past tense, show them something that relates to the past that gets them thinking about a particular past event. In the warmer, do not use the target language you are teaching. Do not expect your learners to. Do not reveal the target language in the warmer. Just establish the context. Now, I know that a lot of our course materials tend to say five to 10 minutes, but opt for the shorter version here. A warmer should not really exceed five minutes. It's a quick stage to engage your learners and introduce the context. Right, so the very next stage is your presentation stage. And this is where I like to say the teacher is at their busiest. So this is where you're going to be eliciting a model sentence or an example sentence. Again, try to avoid using the target language yourself. Don't incorporate it into your speech. Use your context that you set in the warmer and see if you can ask them simple little prompting questions that will help them to put together that first model sentence. Then, of course, elicit the form of that model sentence and concept check their understanding of function. And in that, you've covered your MFP, meaning form and pronunciation. Your body, your presentation stage here, sorry, should really be about 15 to 20 minutes. I know that seems long, but think about it. You're introducing new target language for the very first time. And you're doing so through eliciting and concept checking and not just giving away examples. So it could take a little bit of time. But what the good thing is about eliciting and about concept checking is that your students are involved from start to finish. It's a very interactive stage and they're not bored for a second because they're part of every single step. And then we have the practice stage. Now, the practice stage is accuracy based. Again, a gapful task, an unscrambling task, an error correction task. Your accuracy, your, your practice uh, task really should allow them to practice the form, the structure of what you've just taught. And again, the answers are predetermined so that you can actually check them together as a class. They can check their answers in pairs. So make sure that your task is really controlled so that it's easy to error correct. And then finally, not finally, but in the PPP structure, we've got the third P and that is for production. And similar to the communicative task in the reading lesson, that production stage is for freer practice. And here we're looking at freer based tasks to facilitate the development of fluency. Look at 15 to 20 minutes once again. And if you think that it's going to be too um, intense for them to do one speaking task that spans over 15 minutes, remember you can create two speaking tasks. Maybe the first one is a discussion and the second one is a role play. The first one could be a conversation where you give them a topic to discuss. The second one could be a simulation task where you create a fictional situation and they've got to uh, speak as though they are the characters in that fictional situation. And finally, the plenary. So here you can review what has been learned. You can perhaps do a whole class discussion or Q&A, um, an exit ticket task or or even an eliciting task where you ask them a few of those eliciting questions you asked early, earlier on, concept checking questions, just to consolidate learning and wrap things up knowing that your learners understand the target language. And now when you free them and you open those doors, they'll be able to produce that target language accurately outside. Right, so we're also going to briefly look 
at functional language lesson stages. So when we talk about functional language, think about language like giving directions or giving advice. Again, there's a warmer to establish a context. I had a lesson on giving advice not too long ago, and I wrote a problem I had on the board, and I said, this is my problem, what can I do? I didn't use the target language I was going to expect them to do later on, but they had to offer ideas and offer suggestions, and this took about five minutes. But you can also do a role play. Um, you can show them an image once again. Then we have the presentation stage and the presentation stage is to an elicit an example sentence to elicit the form to concept check understanding of function and again 15 to 20 minutes in an hour lesson time frame then we have the practice stage and once again worksheets where accuracy is the main goal uh, predetermined answers or outcomes that you're expecting so that if they get them right Great, they've got it. If they get them wrong, it clearly exposes the gaps and you can address those. And then finally, the production stage. And again, make it communicative. Give them the opportunity to, to develop their fluency, to have some freedom with the target language. Help them, let them give each other advice about problems that they might have. Let them role play. Um, an, an issue where someone is looking for advice and someone is offering it. So give them some freedom now with the target language. And then again, finally, there's that plenary right at the end. And here we get to review. So think again about a whole, whole class discussion, Q&A, or maybe again, a few eliciting and concept checking questions just to consolidate understanding before you end the lesson. So think about it. We've looked at the warmer, we've looked at the plenary, and then we've looked at the body. And again, the body can take various forms. TTT, PPP, depends on what works for your lesson. Right. So there are other elements in a lesson plan that we've got to look at. And when we get assignments, our students sometimes forget these. So let's have a look at some of the other elements of the lesson plan. When you're looking at the lesson plan, you'll see all those different columns, right? And if you look at the top, there are all those different headings. Now, some of you might see the heading interaction. What does that mean? The interaction column is simply there for you to show us who is interacting with whom during a particular task. For example, if the teacher is giving instructions to the class, the interaction will be TC, teacher class. If students are working in pairs, maybe it's S to S or just pair work. If students are working in groups, maybe you can just write group work or you could write SSS hyphen SSS so that I know that a group of students will be working together. It is important to plan your interaction. The reason is that if you're looking at that interaction column and all you see is TC, 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 then you know there is too much focus on the teacher. The lesson is too teacher centered. But if you're looking at your interaction patterns in your lesson plan and you see a variety of these coming up, then you know, OK, there is a lot of interaction here and the interaction patterns vary, which means students are then working in pairs, then they're working in groups, then they're listening to the teacher, but then they're also giving feedback to the teacher. Make sure that your interaction patterns are varied. The term inclusion means ensuring that all your students, regardless of their ability, ability or additional learning needs have access to learning. This is so important to me personally as a teacher, and I know it will be important to you. It's also very important to create an inclusive learning environment. And the reasons are one, to allow students to reach their goals and to realize their potential, and also to feel valued and included. Your students need to know that they are the most important people in that class. Yes, of course, you need respect and you will command your respect and give it in return, but they need to feel valued, included, and that you really plan the lesson for them, 100% for them. Right, and another term that we're going to be looking at is differentiation. So 
this is just briefly to explain and that it refers to ways in which the teacher can support students with learning needs in one class. Think about it. You've got students who have different learning styles, different learning needs, and you need to take all these into consideration when planning your lessons. So design lessons based on their learning styles. Grouping students maybe by shared interest, topic, or ability for assignments. Remember, your students are most likely going to be of a similar level according to the CEFR levels. So you're going to maybe have an intermediate class or an advanced class. You will not very likely have an elementary student and an advanced student, say, in one lesson. This is unlikely. So already the level is similar, but what you can really hone in on here is their shared interests, topics that interest them and their abilities. Remember that even students of a similar level will have different strengths and weaknesses. I have in one class people who are almost fluent, but when they produce grammar exercises, there are plenty of mistakes. I have students who read well and grasp information, but when they speak, there's an issue. I have students who love reading, love speaking, and when they do listening exercises, they're a little bit weaker. So this is what I mean when I talk about different abilities within one classroom. So assess students' learning. Use formative assessment. Manage your classroom to create a safe and supportive environment. And remember that giving feedback isn't simply focused on error correction, but about the creation of a, of a safe space where students can grow. When we give feedback, think about your students. Think about how they take feedback. Think about how you can make the feedback really, really specific without humiliating or embarrassing a student. Think about different cultures and how they view mistakes in the classroom. So think about all those things when planning um, your lessons, when planning your feedback sessions, when planning your error correction, when planning your interactions. I know it's a lot, but I think that at the beginning, yes, it can be overwhelming. It can be a little disconcerting to have to take all these things into consideration, but it gets easier with time with practice, with research, with further study, you'll get there. So we've come to the end of our presentation and I hope it's been helpful to you. But what I do want you to remember is that you've, if you've missed anything, if you arrived a little bit later and we've covered something that you might have had an interest in, you can of course watch this webinar at a later stage. These are usually uploaded just a few days after they've been done live and you'll be able to to watch them and catch up and make notes uh, so now we've reached the portion of the webinar where you get to ask all those questions that you've been hanging on to uh, throughout the webinar and you'll be able to punch them into the q and a well into the chat function of your screen and i'll be able to answer as many as i can before our time is up so please right now it's your opportunity to punch in your questions and i'll get to uh, to as many of them as i possibly can and then those those of you who arrived i think everyone welcome i have more people from south africa hello nicholas from johannesburg Adrian uh, from Dominican Republic, Judy from Granada, Victor from New Mexico, and then I also have Nenana from Serbia. Well, so uh, welcome to all of you, but it's your opportunity now to ask questions. So remember, you can put them in the chat function and I will get to as many of them as I possibly can. If there is also a question that you have specific to today's webinar, something that you could have possibly missed, please ask, more than happy to assist. So we have a couple of questions coming in. I'd like to look at this first one, Varishka, hello. And Varishka is asking, are all lesson plans 60 minutes regardless of the levels? So Varishka, that is a very good question, but no. Some schools, and I would say most schools, 
have a 60 minute lesson. Um, um, some of them are 50 more. And in, at some schools where I've taught at, it would even be an hour and 20 minutes, a little break and another hour and 20 minutes. So remember, you plan the lesson. If you've decided that it's going to be a grammar lesson of an hour, you can do that. Um, if it's a little bit shorter, remember you can always carry on over into the next lesson, but it is better to finish all your stages in one lesson. So I will say, Varushka, that the most common time frame out there, whether online or whether in class, yes, is about a 60 minute lesson. Give or take a few minutes seems to be the norm out there. All right, thank you for your question. All right, so we're going to be looking at another question. While you are answering the questions, can you please put the lesson aim of the lesson plans up slide again? I will definitely do that a little bit later, Adrian. No problem. All right. And then I've got another question here that I'm going to answer right away. How does one introduce a lesson or establish a content? context without using the thank you for this question because I love this question and the the way we do that is by setting a very strong context one that almost speaks for itself so that you don't have to use the target language and then you ask graded questions so think about what your students already know at that stage and then start asking them questions in the target language sorry not in the target language in the language they already know so say for example you are asking them, you want to introduce the they will exercise more, I will read more books, I will eat healthy food. So that's all projection for the future. So what I like to do here is I like to put up the next year. So if it's 2023, I'll put up 2024 and I'll say to them, right, what are your plans? What are your goals for 2024? And then I'll get some ideas. And I will, and as you can hear, I did not say what will you do or will you do this. I will avoid that. What are your plans? Because they most likely know the present simple already. What are your plans for 2024? What do you want to do in 2024 to make your life better? And then I'll put a few pictures up and they'll start speaking and they'll say, I want to exercise or I exercise teacher, I read more books and then say to them, okay, beginning of presentation stage. Now, how do we say this for the future? I gap exercise more. What can we say to make the sentence about the future and then elicit the word will? So as you can see, it is totally possible to set a context and to draw that sentence out of them without using the target language yourself. And I purposely chose a very low level target language to show you that even with low level target languages, you can still grade your language even lower and get out of them the sentence, the model sentence that you're trying to achieve. I hope that helps. Moral of the story, research what they already know at that level and then use that to elicit the model sentence that you're trying to achieve. Also make your, your context very, very strong and relatable and your students will give, give, give everything you need. If, of course, they give you the bones of the sentence, but they don't give you every little bit, bit and piece that you need. Of course, you're the teacher and you can fill those gaps, but see as far as you can, how much of that model sentence you can. All right, and then I've got a few more questions that have come in. Okay, so I've got another question here from Geraldine. Thank you for your question, Geraldine. It says, over the course, we only skim over the plenary. I like your use of reading terminology there, Geraldine. We only skim over the plenary. Could you give us an, a specific example, please? Absolutely. So, Geraldine, what I first want to tell you is what a, plen a plenary should not be. You should not do anything new. You should not do any activities um, that you're introducing for the first time. Your plenary really should be a consolidation of the lesson. So what I like to do, say for example, I have taught the future simple during the lesson. 
in the plenary, I, I will either ask them, right, I'm a new student. I arrived late. I want you to tell me what we did in this lesson, what the form is, why we use this target language, and peer teach to their partners as though the partner has arrived late. That's one example. Another example is so simple, and this is something you can plan just like that. A few eliciting and concept checking questions. Do we use this about the past? Do we use it for the present? Is this about the future? Is it something I want to do? Is it my plan? A few concept checking and eliciting questions. So Geraldine, what we do here is nothing new that gets introduced at the end. It's just a way to um, Q&A. You tell your students throughout the lesson to write down little questions. Give them a little notebook. Tell them to keep it on the side of the desk and they've got to write down questions during the course of the lesson. And during the plenary, you can do Q&A too. Now, in the assignment, Geraldine, we do ask you to do something very specific. And I have mentioned it during um, this, this uh, answering session. I've given you a couple of examples of what we actually expect in the assignment. So it is something that we really push in the assignment. So remember that you can ask them a few eliciting questions, a few concept checking questions just to consolidate learning. I hope that helps. All right. OK, another useful question. Linton, uh, when setting up the lesson plan, how do you know how to allocate the correct amount of time for each stage? So I want you to think about the lesson are you given for that lesson so say for example you're given 60 minutes then you know okay my warmer needs to be really short five to ten minutes maximum i need that amount of time for the free or practice task i need this one and then linton my suggestion is try the activities yourself in planning now yes of course you're going to get everything right very quickly so you've got to have time and, and, and factor this in. But my advice is if you've got two controlled practice activities, do them according to how long you've taken and add a few minutes for your students. If you are doing a speaking activity, again, Linton, you've got to think about how long that will take because a lot of teachers tend to overcompensate and they give 15 minutes, but then the speaking activity is where two students have got to tell each other something they did on the weekend. That will fly by and that and they'll have lots and lots of time left. You then need to maybe plan two or three tasks. So during the course, we give in our model lessons, in our templates, we give you a lot of guidance as to what each stage should entail and how long. But again, as mentioned, if you're planning um, private lessons, for example, and you're not given those specifications, then of course, try the activities yourself, time them, think about the level of your students, add a little bit of time, and then that'll give you a great idea of how long each stage should be and how long activities will take also. But you you do get a lot of input course material too. So have a look. All right, I hope that helps. And then we've got another question here from Victor. Thank you for your question. If students have different learning styles, how can one adapt for each student's specific needs within 60 minutes? It's hard. Victor, but it's possible. Now remember that you're not going to have every single different student with a different learning style. You're not going to have 17 different learning styles in one lesson. But what we mean here is just those students who do have unique learning styles, learning challenges, and so forth. Now I have um, students in my class at the moment um, in one class, and I have students who love reading and read well, read quickly, and grasp information out of that text with ease. And then I have students who don't like reading. They're allergic to reading. <laughs> They'd rather watch a documentary or biography of some kind. And then I have students who sort of need the uh, typical classroom. So what I do is I make sure that in one lesson, Victor, 
I've got a reading task. I've got speaking tasks. I've got tasks where they can take notes. I've got tasks where they speak and have to listen to each other and maybe record some of the information they've heard from another student. So make sure in one lesson, even if the skill to practice is reading that there are other skills that you get to practice there too. If you've got students who learn through rhythm and music, um, give them opportunities to get up and move. Students who love speaking but they have problems with grammar, give them some nice grammar focus but break it up with speaking activities in between. Have them compare their answers verbally, have them discuss why they've chosen those answers. So make sure that you've got opportunities within your lesson to cater to all these needs. It's difficult but that's why we plan. So Victor, it gets easier with time but get to know your students a little bit too. Do a needs analysis at the beginning of the week at the beginning I see exactly what it is they need and how they learn me for example I'm a very visual learner show me a picture and I'll never forget the meaning of a word give me a lengthy wordy explanation and I'll forget just like that so for those learners make sure that they are imagery and you know what your students who do not necessarily learn through imagery or retain information through imagery they'll enjoy the scenes anyway so just make sure that you incorporate as much as you can of course, we cannot maybe cater to each and every need in one get to have them for one lesson. So see it as much as you can. Try to accommodate for all these students. It gets easier. I really hope that helps. All right. Okay, so I've got another question here. And I do feel it's a good question because this is something that is so easily forgotten. Even when I plan lessons, I will admit, still today, I sometimes forget to plan interaction. So Rita, thank you for your question. She said, on the lesson plan example in unit five, can you please explain the interaction coding, the patterns, right? So I did go over them briefly earlier, but it's not a problem to just revise them again. So T to C means teacher to class. That's usually, Rita, when a teacher is giving instructions to the class or presenting a scenario to the class. But here the teacher is giving information and the focus is very much on the teacher. And then we have um, student to class, something to the entire class. Maybe pair work is where the teacher says, right, now you're going to do a role play activity. These are your roles. This is the topic. This is the time. And then, of course, you put them in pairs and they go off and they do their thing. Maybe even a controlled worksheet. You can give them a worksheet and have them do the worksheet in pairs. And that's where your interaction coding or patterns will be S to S. So there are other interaction patterns. It, it is in the course, but again, send us a question to tutor support. If you find for some reason a brand new interaction pattern and you've never seen this before or heard of it before, please ask us. We can absolutely clarify. All right. So remember, the the the, the important thing is just to know what those various little um, acronyms stand for: ST or abbreviations, ST, T. And then, of course, you mix them up the way you feel. So if, for example, the students are giving feedback to the teacher, then maybe it's going to be C. One student, if you're eliciting and one student is giving you some, some feedback, of course, then it's ST2T. So, you know, I think the important thing to learn is just what these little abbreviations stand for. And then the patterns sort of come by themselves according to the tasks you've planned and according to who is interacting with whom at a particular uh, stage or task of the lesson. All right. All right, Anana, I'm absolutely going to ask, answer your question because it is actually related. She says, uh, oh, sorry, they say, sorry, maybe my question is not connected to the content. I would like to know how we are tested on all of this. Your assignments. Your assignments are how we test this. This is why we're going through the lesson plans today, because in our assignments, you are 
um, required to draw up lesson plans for various skill sets, which is why we're doing the webinar today. So yes, to answer your question, these concepts are tested um, in ask you to produce the various lesson plans that we are referring to today. Not all of them, some um, of our assignments ask for specific lesson plans or specific parts of lesson plans, but the idea today is to cover as much as possible so that you're prepared for whatever assignment you're about to embark on. All right. So I've got another question here, the whole course. focuses on who you use TTT, when should we use TTT? So remember, PPP for me is the most common. It's the one I use mostly in my class. But as mentioned earlier, with TTT, we often use TTT when, for example, we are comparing something that they've learned prior to the lesson to something that they're learning in the lesson. So we first test, then we teach, then we test again. And that's when we use the TTT structure. So yes, in our assignment that you're going to be focusing on, but TTT is certainly something that you might want to experiment with when you go out there and you start teaching. And you'll see, based on what your students know, based on what you did the week before, based on what you really want to assess, you'll know when you want to use TTT versus maybe your PPP. But in this course for the assignments, it's mostly the PPP structure. All right, I have another question here. Thank you for the presentation. Do all these strategies apply to online teaching or are there specific lesson plan procedures for online classes? So I swear by these, even in an online setting. Your online classes really should mirror your face-to-face -face classes. Your students should get that same interaction. They should get that same preparation and planning. It's just that the exercises, the visuals, the tools, the, the, the functions that you're using, yes, they've been adapted for an online. Your stages, your structure, still pretty much the same. Your online students also want to be engaged with an interesting and relatable warmer. They also want to be um, part of the process when you're presenting new target language through eliciting and concept checking. And then yes, accuracy. You can send them live worksheets. You can project a worksheet on your screen. They then have to punch the answers in. During the freer practice, put them into a breakout room of some kind so that they have independence, that autonomy and that freedom to just sort of talk to each other. And you can totally spy on them by checking in those breakout rooms. You can um, switch off the camera and just listen in, or you can sort of pop in and listen as they produce the target language naturally. And then of course the plenary, yes, absolutely, to consolidate. So to answer your question, and it's a brilliant question, yes, you will absolutely have the same stages the same context, all those things apply, but yes, the tools you use, those little gimmicks you use, how you present activities to them will just be an actual face-to-face -face plan. I hope that helps. I teach online all the time and I find that my learners definitely want that same structure. They want the same structure, they also want to be engaged. So, and you know what, Deborah, it makes my planning so much easier, knowing that I can take a face-to-face -face lesson plan and simply adapt it for online use. And there you go, planning done in five minutes. All right. Um, and then someone asked me to put, I'm going to give you a little bit of advice. This webinar will be available shortly and you'll be able to go back and view those slides, pause them, take a screenshot as you wish. So I promise you this webinar will be up. Our past webinars are up. One with a very similar topic might already be there. So if you don't have the link for our past webinars, please send us an email to tutor support. We'll send you the link and you'll be able to have a look. You will not miss a thing we don't don't want you to revisit those slides um, in, in the webinar a few days from now, 
or visit the previous webinars and you'll be able to see exactly what you missed. All right, um, and then I have another question here. When are we going to be assigned lesson plans and how do we submit them? Right, are you referring to our course and the assignments? Well, you will be notified because as you finish a few units, you then reach, after you've done the, the end of unit test, you reach the assignment page and it tells you exactly, in crazy detail, exactly what you have to do. So you finish the relevant units, you get to the assignment page. My advice is to do the assignment as you reach it. Do not skip over completing the rest of the online course and then doing the assignments at the end. You've, you'll find that you may run out of time. So. You do the, the relevant units, you get to the assignment unlocked, and you're able to go through the detailed instructions and answer all the questions and submit all the files. You, we have various um, videos that will show you exactly how to upload your files, but first and foremost, you'll know exactly what to do in terms of lesson plan um, that we want, the class that you're allocated, the target language is prescribed, you'll know what to do. All right. Okay, are there any other questions? And maybe I'm, I'm trying to go through the older question thing. All right, I have not missed anything. So if there are any questions before we wrap up, please ask. I'll be more than happy to answer just one or two final questions. We are running out of time, so please ask your questions before we wrap up. And thank you for all the other questions that have come through. They've been great. They've been valid and really happy if we can eradicate any confusion around this topic. All right, so I've just joined. This is my first webinar. Well, welcome to you. Where can I find out what I've missed? You will absolutely be able to do that. As I mentioned earlier, the webinars are normally available just a few days after they've been done live and you'll be able to access them. And then also you'll be able to access all our past webinars. So Nenana, what are a, um, a ticket to tutor support and simply tell us I would like to access all the webinars please give me the link and we will happily send you the link and then you can scroll through all the webinars and watch any of the, those that interest you or those that you feel you particularly need for your assignments and course material so you'll absolutely be able to watch them again and again and again also remember that there will be a webinar in our next week place but from the TEFL Academy where we'll be more than happy to answer more of your pertinent questions. So it looks like we've come to the end and I want to thank you for joining us today. It's been wonderful having you here and please remember we have another great webinar next week. Join, get as much information that you'll be that will help you with the upcoming assignments and I assure you, watching these webinars, going through your course material, you'll be A-OK. -okay. Adrian, I'm just gonna, I did address your, um, your, your concern. Please, 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 you will be able to access those slides um, of this webinar within a few days, but also a similar webinar has already been done with similar slides. Just send us a ticket, we'll send you the link and you'll be able to go on to the um the webinar and see all those slides i don't want you to miss anything all right so again thank you all and thank you for all the thank yous coming in i hope hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you at our next webinar but before you go something important and this is just to really get your input and to see you know what you think of the webinars and any topics that you feel we can absolutely include i've put the survey link into the chat function, save it, and you'll absolutely be able to let us know how you feel. All right, and again, thank you. Adrian, I see your message, but please don't worry about it. You will 
absolutely have access to all this information, my face, all these slides within a few days. But as I mentioned, send us a ticket, we'll send you the link and you can actually see the past webinar that's very similar to this one. All right, so you're welcome. Have a great weekend, guys, and see you next time.